Okay, so good morning once again, everyone. No? So for today, we're going to have a summarized discussions or summary discussions of our uh, entire semester topic uh, in quantitative methods no? <clears throat> based on the given course outline. No? So the quantitative methods refers to a set of statistical and mathematical techniques no? used to analyze and interpret data in order to draw conclusions and make predictions. No? In, in, in a course on quantitative methods, no? uh, a student can expect to learn about various statistical tools such as hypothesis testing, regression analysis, and <clears throat> data visualization and how to apply these techniques to real-world problems. <clears throat> the course uh, covers topics such as probability theory, descriptive statistics, inferential statistics, uh, statistical model, modeling, no? and experimental design. So... Throughout the course, no, we uh, we work with data sets and apply the techniques uh, to learn and to analyze and interpret the data. And this may involve uh, conducting experiments, collecting and analyzing survey data, or working with publicly available data sets. <clears throat> the specific objective of the course on quantitative methods may vary depending on its uh, level of the course, but some common objectives include Understanding the principle of probability theory in statistical inference, including hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, and significant testing. Developing proficiency in statistical software tools. No? <clears throat> Learning to design and conduct experiments and surveys and to collect and analyze data from these sources. Understanding the principle of statistical modeling, in, in, including linear and logistic regression, time series analysis, and un, un, other multivariate methods. No? develop skills in data visualization and communications of statistical findings, uh, including the use of graphs, tables, and uh, statistical summaries. No? <clears throat> Applying uh, quantitative methods to real-world problems such as business decision-making, policies, analysis, policy analysis, and social research. No? Developing critical thinking and problem-solving skills through the analysis of complex data sets and applications of statistical methods and appreciate the limitations and assumptions of quantitative analysis and understanding when and how to apply different uh, statistical methods to address different research questions. Okay. So our discussion or our course outline covered introduction to quantitative methods, descriptive statistics, probability theory, inferential statistics, multivariate analysis, uh, research design and sampling techniques and computer applications and quantitative methods. And the last topic is the ethics and professional standards in quantitative methods. <clears throat> Again, uh, to start with a summary, you know, quantitative methods uh, are essential in research because they provide a systematic and objective approach to gathering, analyzing, and interpreting data. And these methods involve the use of statistical techniques and mathematical models not to measure and quantify data, allowing researchers to draw conclusions and make predictions based on empirical evidence. Some of the reasons why quantitative methods are so important in research is, number one is the objectivity. No? One of the main advantages of qualitative methods is that they provide an objective approach to research. Now, by using statistical analysis to measure and analyze data, researchers can avoid bias no? and ensure that their findings are based on empirical evidence rather than personal opinions or beliefs. Okay. Number two is the precision. Qualitative methods allow researchers to me measure and quantify data with a high degree of precision. No? The, uh, this is particularly important <clears throat> when studying large populations or when attempting to identify small differences or changes in data over time. Number three is replicability. Now, because quantitative methods involve systematic and objective data collection and analysis, they are highly replicable. No? And this means that all other researchers can repeat the study using the same methods and obtain similar results. Number four is the generalizability. No? Quantitative methods <clears throat> allow researchers to generalize their findings to larger populations by selecting a representative sample and using statistical techniques to analyze the data, and researchers can make predictions about how a larger population would behave 
or respond to a particular interventions. Number five is testability. No? Quantitative methods allows researchers to test hypotheses no? and theories using empirical evidence. So by collecting and analyzing data, the researchers can determine why, whether their hypotheses are supported or refuted by the evidence. And the last is, of course, the efficiency. Quantitative methods are open more efficient than qualitative methods, no? particularly when studying large population. So by using uh, standardized surveys or questionnaires, researchers can collect a large amount of data in a relatively short amount of time. Again, quantitative methods are essential in research because they provide a systematic and objective approach to gathering, analyzing, and interpreting of data. They allow researchers to avoid bias, measure and quantify data with precision, and generalize finding to larger populations, test hypotheses and theories, and do so in an efficient and replicable manner. <clears throat> Statistical analysis plays a, ro a crucial role in quantitative methods as it provides a way to make sense of data that has been collected. Statistical analysis involves using mathematical tools and techniques to organize, analyze, and interpret the data, making it possible to draw meaningful conclusions from the data. There are different types of statistical analysis that can be used in quality, quantitative methods, no? uh, including descriptive statistics, inferential statistics, and modeling technique. Uh, an overview of these types of statistical analysis for descriptive statistics, it involves summarizing and descript, describing the main features of data that has been collected. Now, this include measure of central tendency uh, based on the presenter demonstrate pa kayo ng mean, computation ng mode, median, and mode, and measure of dispersion, no, including the standard deviation, variance, and descriptive statistics are useful for providing a snapshot of the data and for identifying patterns or trends. <clears throat> Next will be the inferential statistics. No? Uh, it involves using the data that has been collected from a sample to make inferences about the larger population. So this involves using probability theory to estimate the likelihood that a particular result could have occurred by chance. No? Inferential statistics no, are used to test hypotheses, <clears throat> make predictions, and draw conclusions about the population based on the sample data and the modeling techniques. Now, modeling techniques involves using statistical models to represent relationship between variables in the data. Pag sinabi natin relationship, automatic, it tests or kaya naman, uh, di ba, under siya ng ANOVA. No? This include linear regression models, no? logistic regression models in ANOVA or analysis of variance models, among others. Modeling techniques are used to identify patterns or relationships in data and to make predictions about future outcomes. We need to understand that the role of statistical analysis play a crucial role in quantitative methods by providing a framework for collecting, analyzing, <clears throat> organizing, interpreting, and presenting data. It helps researchers or it helps us or the practitioners to draw meaningful conclusions, make predictions, and inform decision-making based on the data. <clears throat> Again, quantitative methods refers to the collection and analysis of numerical data to answer research question or, or test hypothesis. It involves the use of statistical analysis and mathematical modeling to, me to measure quantify and analyze data. <clears throat> Quantitative methods are widely used in, the, in many different fields, no? including IT, social sciences, business, health sciences, and engineering, to name a few. And these methods are particularly useful when studying a large population or when attempting to identify patterns or relationship between variables. If you have some additional inputs, questions, do not hesitate to post in our chat box now so we could be able to address after my discussion. Okay. So there are several steps involved in quantitative research process. No? This include defining the research question. <clears throat> the first step in any research project is to clearly define the research question or problem that you want to investigate. Afterwards, no, selecting a sample. Once you have defined your research question, <clears throat> you need to select a representative sample from the population and you are studying. So this is typically done through random sampling techniques. Pero may natanggap yung probability sampling and then probability sampling. No? And then afterwards, collecting data. Data can be collected through a variety of methods. 
including surveys, questionnaires, experiments, and observational studies. Then after that, analyzing the data. Once the data has been collected, so it needs to be analyzed using statistical methods to identify patterns and relationship between variables. And then afterwards, drawing conclusion. Based on the results of the data analysis, you can draw conclusion and make recommendations. So no, most commonly right after the uh, surveys, no, uh, dyan na pumapasok yung gumagawa na tayo ng statistical treatment, no, ina-apply na natin. Then at the same time, uh, most commonly sa other university, mayroong uh, table lang, then discussion. Yung iba namang university, table, graph, bawa, table may discussion, graph may discussion. Pero siyempre mas advisable isa lang kasi the same lang naman yung konsepto. But again, depende pa rin sa iyong study. May study naman na better na graph lang ang gagamitin instead na table. Okay? But sa Philippine setting, most commonly po tayo table talaga with discussion. Some common quantitative methods include surveys, no? as, I, as what we discussed. Survey involve asking a set of standard questions and standardized questions to a sample of individuals in order to collect data on their attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. When it comes to experiments, so it involves manipulating one or more variables in a controlled <clears throat> settings no? to measure the effect on other variables. And we have observational studies. It involves observing and recording data on a particular phenomenon without manipulating any variables. And the statistical analysis. No? It involves using mathematical techniques to analyze data such as calculating means, standard deviation, and correlation. Quantitative methods involve the collection and analysis of numerical data to answer research question or test hypothesis. And this method are particularly useful when studying large population or when attempting to identify patterns or relationship between variables. <clears throat> Analytics is the process of using data, statistical and quantitative methods, and computational techniques to uncover insights and make informed decisions. Analytics is used in various industries, including business, healthcare, finance, IT, and marketing, among others. Uh, analytics provide businesses with the ability to make data-driven decisions, which can lead to increased efficiency, productivity, and profitability. So the exponential growth of data, businesses can leverage analytics to gain insights into customer behavior, market trends, and operational efficiencies. Analytics can also help businesses identify areas of improvement reduce costs, and optimize their resources. <clears throat> so, again, as what we mentioned, no, we need to identify the problem, data collection, data preparation. No? Uh, this will be the overview of data analytics process in its step. So, it involves the following steps. So, defining the problem, understanding the business problem or questions that needs to be answered. No? Uh, in your field, no? in your specialization, most commonly, di ba? We need to uh, first understand on how we'll be able to analyze the business problem. Then right after analyzing the business problem, this will be the time for us to do a prototyping. Then saka pa natin ipoprogram talaga. Then after that, data collection. So collecting relevant data from various sources, including internal and external sources. <clears throat> Next is data collection. No? Collecting relevant data from various uh, sources. No? Then data preparation. Cleaning transforming and extracting the data to make it ready for analysis. Exploratory data analysis, analyzing and visualizing the data to understand the patterns and relationship. And for the statistical analysis, no, using statistical methods to draw insights and make inferences from the data. For predictive modeling, no, building our models to predict future outcomes or behavior based on its historical data. And for prescriptive analytics, it provides uh, recommendations or suggestions for action based on the insights and predictions from the data. Uh, the types of analytics, now there are four main types of analytics, not just descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. Descriptive analytics helps to summarize no, and describe past events and trends. Diagnostic analytics help to identify the root cause of the problem or issue. Predictive analytics use as statistical models and machine learning algorithms to predict uh, future outcomes based on the historical data. And prescriptive analytics helps to identify the best courses of action to take in a given situation. Okay? And on lesson, num lesson number two, we discuss about descriptive <laughs> statistics. No? Covered measure of central tendency, measure of dispersion, and measure of shape. No? 
So descriptive statistics is a branch of statistics that involves the collection, presentation, and analysis of data. The main goal of descriptive statistics is to summarize and describe the key features of data set. This can be done using various measures of central tendencies, such as the mean, median, and mode, as well as the measures of variability, such as the range, variance, and the standard deviation. There are two main types of data, no? categorical and numerical data. No? Categorical data is a non-numeric data that is typically grouped into categories or labels, such as sex or color. Numerical data, on the other hand, is quantitative data that can be measured and expressed as numbers such as age or weight. <clears throat> in measure of central tendency, the first step in analyzing a data set is to determine its measure of central tendency. And these measures help to describe the typical value or behavior of the data set. So the three most common measures of central tendency are mean. No, The mean is the average of all the data points in a data set. It is calculated by adding up all the data points and dividing the by the total number of data points. Next will be the median. So the median is the middle value in the data set. No? To calculate the median, the data must first be sorted from smallest to largest. If there is an even number of data points, the mean, the, the median, then the median is the average of the mean of the two uh, middle values. The mode uh, is the most frequently occurring values in the data set. So if there is no value that occurs more than once, then the data set has no mode. <clears throat> For the measures of variability, no, it describes the spread of dispersion of a data set. The most common measures of variability are range. No? The range is the difference between the largest and the smallest values in the data set. Variance, the variance measures how spread out the data is from the mean. So it is calculated by taking the sum of the squared differences between each data point and the mean and then dividing by the total number of data points minus one. For the standard deviation, no, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. It is measured of how it spread out the data is from the mean. Okay. <clears throat> now, data presentation. No? One of the most important aspects of descriptive statistics is data presentation. Data can be presented in various forms, such as tables, charts, gra or graphs. No? The choices or, or the choice of presentation no format depends on the type of data and the purpose of the data analysis. No? Tables are useful for representing categorical data such as frequency distribution or contingency tables. Charts and graphs are often used to present numerical data such as histogram and scatter plots. Now, this visual aids help to convey the key features of the data set such as the shape, center, and spread. <clears throat> Again, uh, descriptive statistics is an important tool for analyzing and summarizing the data. So by using measures and central tendency and variability, we can describe the key features of the data set and make inferences about the population from which it was sampled. Data presentation is also the, an important aspect of descriptive statistics as it helps no, as it helps to convey the key features of the data in clear and concise manner. <clears throat> the next chapter is the inferential statistics. No? <clears throat> Inferential statistics are used to draw conclusions or make predictions about a population based on a sample of data. And this include techniques such as hypothesis testing, confidence interval, and regression analysis. We need to uh, remind, I, I just want to remind everyone that inferential statistics are a set of techniques used to draw conclusions or make predictions about a population based on sample of data. They allow researchers to make inferences about the population from a sample with a certain level of confidence. So, uh, some common technique used in inferential statistics is the hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is a technique used to test a hypothesis about a population parameter, such as the mean or proportion. So it involves comparing the sample statistics to the expected values under the null hypothesis and calculating the probability of observing the sample data given the null hypothesis. <clears throat> Confidential, uh, confidence interval are a range of values around a sample statistics that is likely to contain the true population parameter with a certain level of confidence. So the confidence level is typically set by 95% or 99%. Parang alcohol lang, ano? 99%. No? 
Another is the regression analysis. No, uh, it is the technique used to model the relationship between two or more variables. No, it allows researcher to make predictions about the dependent variable based on the values of the independent variables. We have ANOVA, no analysis of variance. ANOVA is technique is a technique used to compare the means of three or more groups. So it tests whether the difference between the groups are significant or due to chance. <clears throat> Chi-square test no, is a technique <clears throat> used to test the independence of two categorical variables. No? It includes comparing the observed frequencies to the expected frequencies under the null hypothesis. Inferential statistics are important in data analysis because they allow researchers to draw conclusions about the populations from a sample of data. And they provide a way to test hypotheses and make these predictions about the future. However, it is important to be aware of the limitations of inferential statistics, including the assumptions that underlie the technique and the potential for sampling error. <clears throat> mathematical modeling. No? Mathematical modeling involves using mathematical equations to describe and predict the behavior of complex system. This includes techniques such as linear and nonlinear model, optimization, and simulation. Mathematical modeling is the process of creating or mathematical representation of the real world system or problem. So it involves using mathematical equations and models to describe and analyze the behavior of a system or phenomenon. Mathematical models can be used to make predictions, test hypotheses, and understand the underlying mechanism of the system. Uh, the process of mathematical modeling typically involves several steps. Siyempre, define the problem. Uh, in mathematical modeling is to define the problem or system being studied. This involves identifying the key variables, parameters, and relationships that are relevant to the problem. Then afterwards, formulate the model. Once the problem has been defined, the next step is to create a mathematical model that represents the systems or phenomenon. And this involves choosing the appropriate equations, variables, and parameters to describe the behavior of the system. Then after that, analyze the model. After the model has been formulated, it is analyzed to understand its properties and behavior. This may involve uh, solving the equations analytically, simulating the model numerically, or using other computational techniques. Then after that, validate the model. The next step is to validate the model by comparing its predictions to real-world data or experimental results. Now, if, uh, if the model accurately predicts the behavior of a system, it can be used to make predictions or test hypotheses. Then afterwards, use the model. So once the model has been validated, it can be used to explore the behavior of the system under different conditions, make predictions about future outcomes, and optimize the performance of the system. <clears throat> then, Mathematical modeling is used in many fields, including physics, biology, engineering, economics, and social sciences. It is a powerful tool for understanding complex systems and making predictions about their behavior. However, it is important to be aware of the limitations of mathematical models, including the assumptions that underlie them and the potential for uncertainty and error. Data visualization involves creating graphical representation of data to communicate patterns and relationship. So this include techniques such as scatter plots, okay, uh, histograms, and box plots. No? Data visualization is the presentation of data and information through graphical or visual means, such as charts, graphs, maps, and other visual aids. The goal of data visualization is to help people understand and interpret complex data and to communicate insights effectively. <clears throat> Data visualization is used in a wide range of fields, including business, IT, finance, healthcare, science, and social media. It can be used to identify trends, patterns, relationships in data to compare data sets to illustrate complex concepts and communicate insights to others. There are many different uh, of data, different types of data visualization. It's with uh, its own strengths and weaknesses. No common types of visualization includes bar charts. Line, line graphs, no scatter plots, head maps, and bubble charts. The choice of visualization depends on the type of data being analyzed, the audience, and the insight that need to be communicated. Effective data visualization requires careful planning and design. 
it is important to choose the appropriate visualization type, use colors and fonts effectively, and provide clear labels and titles. Good data visualization can help people make informed decisions and take actions based on insights derived from data. Quantitative methods are essential in many fields for making informed decisions based on data. They allow researchers and analysts to uh, identify patterns in relationship that may not be immediately obvious and to test hypotheses and make decisions about the future. Okay, how about multivariate analysis? So multivariate analysis is a statistical approach used to analyze the relationship and patterns among multiple variables simultaneously. So it explore the interaction and dependencies between variables, no, aiming to uncover underlying structures, groups, or dimensions within the data. Multivariate analysis no, techniques provide insights into complex data sets and can be applied in various fields such as psychology, market research, and social media. When it comes to factor analysis, no, it is a statistical technique used to explore the underlying structure or dimension of a set of observed variables. It aims to identify a smaller number of latent factors that explain the patterns and correlations among the observed variables. So by reducing the dimensionality of the data, factor analysis helps simplify the interpretations and understanding of complex data set. It commonly used in survey research and psychometrics to uncover the underlying construct or factors influencing responses. For cluster uh, analysis, it is the method used to group similar objects or observation based on their characteristics or attributes. Or attributes. Uh, <clears throat> it aims to identify homogeneous groups or clusters within a larger data set. So the algorithm categorizes the object based on their similarities or dissimilarities, now clustering them into distinct groups. Cluster analysis often used in market segmentation, customer segmentation, and pattern recognitions to identify meaningful subgroups within a population. We have discriminant analysis. Now, it is a technique used to classify observation for objects into predefined groups based on their characteristics or predictor variables. It explores the differences between groups and identifies the variables that contribute most of the separation between groups. Discriminant analysis is commonly used in fields such as marketing, finance, and social science to predict group membership or ident to identify the key factors in distinguished different groups. We have interpreting multivariate analysis. No? Interpreting multivariate analysis requires a comprehensive understanding of the specific technique employed in the context of the data. Few considerations, of course, the sabi ko kanina, factor analysis, no? uh, cluster analysis, discriminant analysis, Okay, so multivariate analytics is techniques, no? analysis techniques such as factor analysis, cluster analysis, and discriminant analysis is uh, enables researchers to explore patterns, no? relationship, and grouping with uh, complex data sets. So interpreting the results involve understanding the specific technique uses and considering the context and goal of the analysis. No? These techniques will provide valuable insights. Uh, for understanding the underlying structure and relationship among variables. <clears throat> research design and sampling techniques. No? Research design refers to the overall plan or structure of a research study. So it provides a framework for conducting the study and collecting, analyzing, and interpreting data. The research design is uh, determined by the research objectives, research question, and the future or the nature of phenomenon being investigated. Sampling technique is the process of selecting a subset of individuals or units from a larger population to participate in research studies. So the choice of sampling techniques depends on the research objectives, available sources, and the characteristic of population being studied. Some commonly used sampling techniques is random sampling. No? Uh, it involves selecting individuals from a population randomly, ensuring that each member of the population has an equal chance of being included in the sample. It helps to minimize bias and increase the general stability of the findings. <clears throat> we have a stratified sampling. No? It involves dividing the population into homogeneous subgroups or strata and then randomly selecting individual from each stratum. These techniques ensure representation from different subgroups and allows for more precise estimation within each stratum. 
we have cluster sampling. No, it involves dividing the population into cluster or groups and randomly selecting entire cluster to be included in the sample. It is useful when the population is geographically dispersed or when the there are natural clusters with the population. We have convenient sampling. No, uh, it involves selecting individuals who are readily available and accessible to the researchers. Kadalasan ginagamit ito sa quali, no? While this technique is convenient, it may introduce bi bias and limit the general stability of the findings. <clears throat> and lastly, the snowball sampling. It involves identifying initial participants and then asking them to refer other potential participants. And this technique is useful when the target population is difficult to reach or locate. How about experimental and non-experimental design? <clears throat> Experimental design involves manipulating independent variables and measuring their effects on dependent variable. In an experimental design, participants are randomly assigned to different conditions or groups, including a control group. And this allows for casual inference and help establish cause and effect relationship. For non-experimental design, it refers to the studies where the researcher does not manipulate the independent variable. Instead, the researchers observes and measures variable as they naturally occur. Non-experimental design include observational studies, correlational study, and descriptive study. While non-experimental design cannot establish casualty, they provide valuable insights and explore relationship between variables. <clears throat> survey research design involves collecting data through questionnaires or surveys to gather information from sample of individuals. Uh, it is common research design in social sciences, marketing research, and opinion polls. Now, survey research design can be a cross-sectional, no, data collected at one point in a time, or longitudinal, no, data collected over multiple time points. Survey research design includes several important considerations. <clears throat> Number one is sampling. The, determine the appropriate sampling techniques to select the survey participants and ensure the sample represents the target population. We have questionnaire, no? Uh, develop a well-structured questionnaire that includes clear and relevant questions. Consider using uh, validated scales and techniques to enhance the reliability and validity of data. Data collection, no? Determine the mode of data collection such as online surveys, phone interviews, or in-person interviews. <clears throat> O kaya Google Form, no? Ang ginagamit natin. Consider the advantages and limitation of each method. For data analysis, no? An analyze the, the survey data using appropriate statistical techniques such as descriptive statistics, correlations, regression analysis, depending on the research question and variable interest. Another is, of course, is the, uh, the ethical considerations. In any research design, ethical considerations should be taken into account. Researcher must ensure the protection of participants' rights and including informed consent, confidentiality, and voluntary participation. Ethical guidelines and uh, institutional review boards no, provide guidance on conducting research ethically. Research design provides a framework for conducting a study while sampling techniques help select participants. <clears throat> The next topic, of course, is the computer applications and quantitative methods. Computer applications play a vital role in quantitative methods by providing tools in software to handle data management, statistical analysis, and modeling. Uh, these applications enable researchers to process and analyze large data sets efficiently you know, and derive meaningful insights you know, from the data. Uh, we explore some commonly used software and tools for quantitative analysis. Last time, we discussed natin yung SPSS. It stands for the Statistical Package for the Social Sciences. SPSS is a widely used statistical software package that provides a range of tools for data management, analysis, and <coughs> reporting. Uh, it offers a user-friendly interface and supports various statistical techniques, including descriptive statistics, hypothesis testing, regression analysis, factor analysis, and more. SPSS allows researchers to import, manipulate, and analyze data as well as generate chart graphs and reports. Meron din tayong Stata. No? Stata is a statistical software package developed by Stata Corp. No? It is uh, commonly used in academic and research setting for data analysis and modeling. 
Stata provides a wide range of statistical techniques, including regression analysis, survival analysis, time series analysis, and panel data analytics or analysis. It is offer a command line interface and a powerful programming language for advanced data manipulation and analysis. <clears throat> Siyempre, Microsoft Excel, no? MS Excel is a data is a widely available uh, spreadsheet program that offers basic statistical analysis capabilities. No, it is open use for data entry, data manipulations, and simple calculation. Excel includes built-in functions for descriptive statistics, correlation analysis, regression analysis, and hypothesis testing. While uh, it may not have the advanced statistical capabilities of dedicated statistical software, Excel can still be useful tool for basic data analysis. <clears throat> for data management and analysis tools, analysis tools are essential for organizing, cleaning, and preparing data for analysis. <clears throat> These tools help researchers handle large data sets, merge data from multiple sources, and ensure that data quality. Some common use data management and analysis tools include SQL, no? the structured query language. Because alam naman natin, no? SQL is a programming language used for managing and manipulating relational databases. So it allows researchers to extract, transform, and load data as well as perform complex data queries and aggregation. Another is Python no? and R programming. <clears throat> Python and R are popular programming languages for data analysis and statistical computing. They provide extensive libraries and packages for data manipulation, visual uh, visualization, and statistical modeling. Researchers can use these languages to implement advanced statistical technique and customize their analysis. So data visualization tools like Tableau, Power BI, and Gplot no, in R for enable researchers to create visually appealing and informative charts, graphs, and dashboard to present their data and analysis result. Choosing the right tool. No? <clears throat> ano bang gagamitin namin, Doc? SPSS, Stata, Excel, uh, and so on. Or SPSS, Stata, and so on. No? Uh, when, when selecting a computer application no, for quantitative methods, it is important to consider the specific needs of the research project. The complexity of the analysis the availability of resources and the researcher's familiarity with the software. Each, sub, each software package and tools has its strengths and limitations. And the choice should align with the research objective and the required statistical techniques. Computer applications are invaluable for quantitative methods, offering powerful, powerful tools for, for data management, statistical analysis, and modeling. So SPSS, Stata, Excel are commonly used software package each with its own features and capabilities. Data management and analysis tools, such as SQL, Python, and R, provide additional flexibility and customization. Choosing the appropriate tool depends on the specific research requirements and researchers' familiarity and with the software. The, I think the last topic that we are going to tackle last meeting is about... <clears throat> Ethics and professional standards and qualitative methods. <clears throat> research ethics refers to the principles and guidelines that ensure the ethical conduct of research. So in quantitative methods, it is essential to uphold ethical standards to protect the rights and well-being of research participants and maintain the integrity of the research process. Some key aspects of research ethics include informed consent. Now, researchers must obtain informed consent from participants ensuring that they are carefully or they are fully informed about the nature of the study, potential risks and benefits, and the right to withdraw from the study at any time. Confidentiality and anonymity. No? Researchers should protect the confidentiality of participants' personal information and ensure that data is collected and stored in a way that maintains anonymity. <clears throat> Privacy. No? Uh, researchers should respect participants' privacy and ensure that their participation in the study does not infringe upon the rights or cause harm. Conflict of interest. No? Researchers should disclose any potential conflicts of interest that may compromise the objectivity and integrity of the research. So data protection. No? Researchers should follow 
appropriate data protections and security measures to safeguard participants' data from unauthorized access or misuse. We have uh, institutional review board approval. So researchers should obtain ethical approval from an IRB or equivalent ethical review body, ensuring that research adheres to ethical guidelines and regulations. For publication ethics, <laughs> Publication ethics encompasses the ethical consideration standard associated with the publication of research findings. So it ensures credibility, transparency, and integrity of the research process. The key aspect of publication ethics include plagiarism. No? Researchers should avoid plagiarism by properly citing and acknowledging the work of others. They should not present them someone else's work, ideas, or findings as their own. Other is author authorship and acknowledgement. <clears throat> Researchers should accurately and fairly attribute authorship, including all individuals who have made significant contributions to the research. No? They should acknowledge the contributions of others who have supported the research in a meaningful way. Data integrity and product reproducibility. No? Researchers should ensure the integrity of the data presented in the research publication. They should provide sufficient information to enable others to replicate or verify their findings or verify findings. No? Another is the publication bias. No? Researchers should strive to avoid publication bias by reporting all relevant findings regardless of their statistical significance or alignment with research hypothesis. And the conflict of interest. No? Researchers should disclose any potential conflicts of interest that may influence the interpretation or reporting of the research findings. <clears throat> Professional standards for data collection analysis help ensure the accuracy, reliability, and validity of the research finding. Some key per professional standards include val val validity and reliability. No? Ito yung laging tinatanong ng panel. Eh, no? How do you ensure the validity and reliability of your research uh, ano, or your capstone project? No? Researchers should uh, use appropriate measures and techniques to ensure the validity and reliability of data collected. They should uh, employ valid, validated instruments, establish rigorous data collection protocols, and ensure data quality control. Hindi yung uh, kinalabit mo lang, pinasagot mo na ng survey. Ano? Pina, pina, pinakain mo lang, pina, validate mo na yun na yung questionnaire. No? Another is the transparency in documentation. <coughs> Researchers should maintain comprehensive documentation of the research design. Data collection, procedures, and data analysis technique used in employed. No? And this documentation enables transparency and facilitates the replication of the study. Another is statistical reporting. Researchers should accurately report the statistical method used in data analysis. That's why it requires uh, to add in our methodology, you know, chapter 3 most commonly. Okay? Uh, they should provide sufficient details to enable others to understand and evaluate the appropriateness of the statistical techniques employed. And the peer review, no? researchers <clears throat> should actively engage in the peer review process by reviewing and providing uh, constructive feedback, no? constructive and term, on the work of their peers. No? They should contribute to maintaining the standard and quality of research in the field. So ethics and professional standards play a crucial role in quantitative methods to ensure the ethical conduct of research. Now, the integrity of the research process and the credibility of research findings. Now, researchers should adhere to ethical guidelines, obtain informed consent, protect participants' confidentiality, and follow publication ethics. They should also uphold professional standards in data collection and analysis, ensuring validity reliability, and transparency. <clears throat> Again, quantitative methods play a crucial role in field of cybersecurity, data science, and information technology education. These disciplines rely on the analysis of data and the application of statistical techniques to make informed decisions and solve complex problems. General summary of the use of quantitative methods in this field. For cybersecurity, quantitative methods are used in cybersecurity to assess and manage risk, analyze security vulnerabilities, and evaluate the effectiveness of security measures. No? Statistical techniques are employed to analyze network traffic patterns, detect anomalies and intrusions, and identify potential threats. 
quantitative methods also help in designing and implement in evaluating encryption algorithm, access control system, and an authentication authentication mechanism. <clears throat> For data science, <clears throat> data science relies heavily on quantitative methods to extract insights and knowledge from large data sets. No? Statistical analysis techniques are used to uncover patterns, relationship, and trends in data. Machine learning algorithms, which are based on quantitative methods, are applied to build predictive models and make data-driven decisions. Quantitative methods also play a crucial role in data processing, feature selection, and evaluation of model performance. In general, for information technology education students, for BSIS, BSIT, BS COMSI, BS Entertainment Multimedia Computing, quantitative methods are incorporated into information technology education to provide students with the skills necessary for data analysis, research, and decision making. Students learn statistical concepts and techniques to analyze data, interpret research findings, and evaluate the performance concept and techniques to analyze data, interpret research findings, and evaluate the performance of IT system. They also gain hands-on experience in using statistical software and tools to several world problems. In this field, knowledge of quantitative method is essential for professionals to effectively assess risk, identify patterns and anomalies, make data-driven decisions, and evaluate the performance of system and algorithm. By understanding and applying quantitative methods, professional in cybersecurity, data science, and IT education can contribute to the advancement of this file or in these fields and address the challenges posed by an increasing data-driven and interconnected world. For your research, we'll also cover some useful tips as well as common pitfalls to avoid when you're undertaking quantitative analysis. So grab a cup of coffee, grab a cup of tea, whatever works for you, and let's jump into it. Hey, welcome to Grad Coach TV, where we demystify and simplify the oftentimes intimidating world of academic research. My name's Emma, and today we're going to unwrap the topic of quantitative data analysis. If you're new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button for more videos covering all things research related. Also, if you're looking for hands-on help with your research, check out our one-on-one -on -one coaching services, where we help you through your dissertation, thesis, or research project step by step. It's basically like having a professor in your pocket whenever you need it. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can learn more and book a free consultation with a friendly coach at www.gradcoach.com. All right, with that out of the way, let's jump into it. Quantitative data analysis is one of those things that often strikes fear into students. It's totally understandable. Quantitative analysis is a complex topic full of daunting lingo like medians, modes, correlations, and regression. Suddenly, we're all wishing we'd paid a little more attention in math class. Now, the good news is that while quantitative data analysis is a mammoth topic, Gaining a working understanding of the basics isn't that hard, even for those of us who avoid numbers and math at all costs. In this video, we'll break quantitative analysis down into simple, bite-sized chunks so you can get comfy with the core concepts and approach your research with confidence. So let's start with the most basic question. What exactly is quantitative data analysis? Despite being quite a mouthful, quantitative data analysis simply means analyzing data that's numbers-based, or data that can be easily converted into numbers without losing any meaning. For example, category-based variables like gender, ethnicity, or native language can all be converted into numbers without losing meaning. For example, English could equal 1, French could equal 2, and so on. 
This contrasts against qualitative data analysis, where the focus is on words, phrases, and expressions that can't be reduced to numbers. If you're interested in learning about qualitative analysis, we've got a video covering that as well. I'll include a link below. So, the next logical question is, what is quantitative analysis used for? Well, quantitative analysis is generally used for three purposes. First, it's used to measure differences between groups. For example, average height differences between different groups of people. Second, it's used to assess relationships between variables. For example, the relationship between weather temperature and voter turnout. And third, it's used to test hypotheses in a scientifically rigorous way. For example, a hypothesis about the impact of a certain vaccine. Again, this contrasts with qualitative analysis, which can be used to analyze people's perceptions and feelings about an event or situation. In other words, things that can't be reduced to numbers. So, how does quantitative analysis work, you ask? Well, since quantitative data analysis is all about analyzing numbers, it's no surprise that it involves statistics. Statistical analysis methods form the engine that powers quant analysis. These methods can vary from pretty basic calculations, for example, averages and medians, to more sophisticated analyses, for example, correlations and regressions. Sounds like a bunch of gibberish? <laughs> Don't worry, we will explain all of that in this video. Importantly, you don't need to be a statistician or a math whiz to pull off a good quantitative analysis. We'll break down all the technical mumbo jumbo in this video. So let's start by taking a look at the two main branches of quantitative analysis. As I mentioned, quantitative analysis is powered by statistical analysis methods. There are two main branches of statistical methods that are used, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. In your research, you might only use descriptive statistics, or you might use a mix of both, depending on what you're trying to figure out. In other words, depending on your research questions, aims, and objectives. I'll explain how to choose your methods later in this video. So, what are descriptive and inferential statistics? Well, before I can explain that, we need to take a quick detour to explain some lingo. To understand the difference between these two branches of statistics, you need to understand two important words. These words are population and sample. First up, population. In statistics, the population is the entire group of people, or animals, or organizations, or whatever, that you're interested in researching. For example, if you were interested in researching Tesla owners in the US, then the population would be all Tesla owners in the United States. However, it's extremely unlikely that you're going to be able to interview or survey every single Tesla owner in the US. Realistically, you'll only get access to a few hundred or maybe a few thousand owners using an online survey. This smaller group of accessible people whose data you actually collect is called your sample. So, to recap, the population is the entire group of people you're interested in, and the sample is the subset of that population that you can actually get access to. In other words, the population is the full chocolate cake, whereas the sample is just a slice of that cake. Can you see what I've got on my mind? <laughs> Anyhow, why is this sample population thing important? Well, descriptive statistics focuses on describing the sample, while inferential statistics aim to make predictions about the population based on the findings within the sample. In other words, we use one group of statistical methods, descriptive statistics, to investigate the slice of cake, and another group of methods, inferential statistics, to draw conclusions about the entire cake. And there I go with the cake analogy again. But to be fair, I always have chocolate on my mind. So with that out of the way, let's take a closer look at each of these branches in more detail, starting with descriptive statistics. 
Descriptive statistics serve a simple but critically important role in your research to describe your data set, hence the name. In other words, they help you understand the details of your sample. Unlike inferential statistics, which we'll get to later, descriptive statistics don't aim to make inferences or predictions about the entire population. They are purely interested in the details of your specific sample. When you're writing up your analysis, descriptive statistics are the first set of stats you'll cover before moving on to inferential statistics. But depending on your research objectives and research questions, they may be the only type of statistics that you use. We'll explore that a little later. So what kind of statistics are usually covered in this section? Well, some common statistical tests used in this branch include the following. The mean. This is simply the mathematical average of a range of numbers. Nothing too complicated here. Next is the median. This is the midpoint in a range of numbers when the numbers are all arranged in order. If the data set makes up an odd number, then the median is the number right in the middle of the set. If the data set makes up an even number, then the median is the midpoint between the two middle numbers. Next up is the mode. This is simply the most commonly repeated number in the data set. Then we have standard deviation. This metric indicates how dispersed a range of numbers is. In other words, how close all the numbers are to the mean, the average. In cases where most of the numbers are quite close to the average, the standard deviation will be relatively low. Conversely, in cases where the numbers are scattered all over the place, the standard deviation will be relatively high. Lastly, we have skewness. As the name suggests, skewness indicates how symmetrical a range of numbers is. In other words, do they tend to cluster into a smooth bell curve shape in the middle of the graph? This is called a normal or parametric distribution. Or do they lean to the left or right? This is called a non-normal or non-parametric distribution. Okay, are you feeling a bit confused? Let's look at a practical example. On the left-hand side is the data set. This data set details the body weight in kilograms of a sample of 10 people. On the right-hand side, we have the descriptive statistics for this data set. Let's take a look at each of them. First, we can see that the mean weight is 72.4 kilograms. In other words, the average weight across the sample is 72.4 kilograms. Pretty straightforward. Next, we can see that the median is very similar to the mean, the average. This suggests that this data set has a reasonably symmetrical distribution. In other words, a relatively smooth centered distribution of weights clustered towards the center. Moving on to the mode. Well, there is no mode in this data set. This is because each number presents itself only once, and so there cannot be a most common number. If, hypothetically, there were two people who were both 65 kilograms, then the mode would be 65. Next up is the standard deviation. 10.6 indicates that there's quite a widespread of numbers. We can see this quite easily by just looking at the numbers, which range from 55 to 90. This is quite a stretch from the mean of 72.4, so we would expect the standard deviation to be well above zero. And lastly, let's look at the skewness. A result of negative 0.2 tells us that the data is very slightly negatively skewed. In other words, it has a very slight lean. This makes sense, since the mean and the median are only slightly different. As you can see, these descriptive statistics give us some useful insight into the data set. Of course, this is a very small data set, only 10 records, so we can't read into these statistics too much. But hopefully, this example helps you understand how these statistics play out in reality. Also, keep in mind that this is not a list of all possible 
descriptive statistics, just the most common ones. So at this point, you might be wondering, but why do these matter? Well, while these descriptive statistics are all fairly basic, they're important for a few reasons. Firstly, they help you get both a macro and micro level view of your data. They help you understand both the big picture and the finer details. Secondly, they help you spot potential errors in the data. For example, if an average is way higher than you'd expect or responses to a question are highly varied, this can act as a warning sign that you need to double check the data. And lastly, these descriptive statistics help inform which inferential statistical methods you can use, as those methods depend on the shape of the data. We'll explore this a little bit more later on. Simply put, Descriptive statistics are really important, even though the statistical methods used are pretty basic. All too often at Grad Coach, we see students rushing past the descriptives in their eagerness to get to the more exciting inferential methods and then landing up with some very flawed results. Don't be a sucker. Give your descriptive statistics all the love and attention they deserve. All right, now that we've looked at descriptive stats, let's move on to the second branch of quantitative analysis, inferential statistics. As I mentioned, while descriptive statistics are all about the details of your specific data set, your sample, inferential statistics aim to make inferences about the population. In other words, you'll use inferential statistics to make predictions about what you'd expect to find in the full population. What kind of predictions, you ask? Well, generally speaking, there are two common types of predictions that research try to make using inferential stats. Firstly, predictions about differences between groups. For example, height differences between children grouped by their favorite sport. And secondly, relationships between variables. For example, the relationship between body weight and the number of hours a week a person does yoga. In other words, inferential statistics, when done correctly, allow you to connect the dots and make predictions about what you'd expect to see in the real world population based on what you observe in your sample data. For this reason, inferential statistics are used for hypothesis testing. In other words, to test hypotheses that predict changes or differences. Of course, when you're working with inferential statistics, the composition of your sample is really important. In other words, if your sample doesn't accurately represent the population you're researching, then your findings won't necessarily be very useful. For example, if your population of interest is a mix of 50% male and 50% female, but your sample is 80% male, you can't make inferences about the population based on your sample since it's not representative. This area of statistics is called sampling, but we won't go down that rabbit hole here. It's a deep one. We'll save that for another video. So what kind of statistics are usually covered in this section? Well, there are many, many different statistical analysis methods within the inferential branch, and it would be impossible for us to discuss them all here. So we'll just take a look at some of the most common inferential statistical methods so that you have a solid starting point. First up are t-tests. T-tests compare the means, the averages, of two groups of data to assess whether they are different to a statistically significant extent. In other words, to see whether they have significantly different means, standard deviations, and skewness. For example, you might want to compare the mean blood pressure between two groups of people. 
one that has taken a new medication and one that hasn't to assess whether they are significantly different. Simply looking at the two means is not enough to draw a conclusion. You need to assess whether the differences are statistically significant, and that's what t-tests allow you to do. Right, next up is ANOVA. ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. This test is similar to a t-test in that it compares the means of various groups, but ANOVA allows you to analyze multiple groups, not just two. So it's basically a t-test, but on steroids. Next we have correlation analysis. This type of analysis assesses the relationship between two variables. In other words, if one variable increases, does the other variable also increase, decrease, or stay the same? For example, if the average temperature goes up, do average ice cream sales increase too? We'd expect some sort of relationship between these two variables intuitively, but correlation analysis allows us to measure that relationship scientifically. <laughs> Lastly, we have regression analysis. Regression analysis is similar to correlation in that it assesses the relationship between variables, but it goes a step further to understand the cause and effect between variables, not just whether they move together. In other words, does the one variable actually cause the other one to move, or do they just happen to move together naturally thanks to another force? Just because two variables correlate doesn't necessarily mean that one causes is the other. To make this all a little more tangible, let's take a look at an example of correlation in action. Here's a scatter plot demonstrating the correlation, or the relationship, between weight and height. Intuitively, we'd expect there to be some sort of relationship between these two variables, which is what we see in this scatter plot. In other words, the results tend to cluster together in a diagonal line from bottom left to top right. The more tightly the results cluster together to form a line in any direction, the more correlated they are and therefore the stronger the relationship between the variables. As I mentioned, these are just a handful of inferential methods. There are many, many more. Importantly, each statistical method has its own assumptions and limitations. For example, some methods only work with normally distributed or parametric data, while other methods are designed specifically for data that are not normally distributed. And that's exactly why descriptive statistics are so important. They're the first step to knowing which inferential methods you can and can't use. Of course, this all begs the question, how do I choose the right quantitative analysis methods for my research? Well, that's exactly what we'll look at next. Now that we've looked at some of the most common statistical methods used within quantitative analysis, let's look at how you go about choosing the right tool for the job. To choose the right statistical methods for your research, you need to think about two important factors. One, the type of quantitative data you have, specifically level of measurement and the shape of the data. And, Two, your research questions and hypotheses. Let's take a closer look at each of these. The first thing you need to consider is the type of data you've collected, or the data you will collect. By data types, I'm referring to the four levels of measurement, namely nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. If you're not familiar with this lingo, you should hit the pause button real 
real quick and go check out our post over on the Grad Coach blog that explains each of these levels of measurement. I'll include the link below. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, because different statistical methods require different types of data. This is one of the assumptions I mentioned earlier. Every method has its assumptions regarding the type of data. For example, some methods work with categorical data, like yes or no type questions, while others work with numerical data, like age, weight, or income. If you try to use a statistical method that doesn't support the data type you have, your results will be largely meaningless. So make sure you have a clear understanding of what types of data you've collected or will collect. Once you have this, you can then check Check which statistical methods support your data types. I'll include a link below the video that explains which methods support which data types. Now, if you haven't collected your data yet, you, you can, of course, reverse engineer the process and look at which statistical methods would give you the most useful insights, and then design your data collection strategy around this to ensure that you collect the correct data types. Another important factor to consider is the shape of your data. Specifically, does it have a normal distribution? In other words, is it a bell-shaped curve centered in the middle? Or is it very skewed to the left or right? Again, different statistical methods work for different shapes of data. Some are designed for symmetrical data, while others are designed for skewed data. This is another reminder of why descriptive statistics are so important, since they tell you all about the shape of your data. The next thing you need to consider is your specific research questions, as well as your hypotheses, if you have some. The nature of your research questions and research hypotheses will heavily influence which statistical methods you should use. If you're just interested in understanding the attributes of your sample as opposed to the entire population, then descriptive statistics might be all you need. For example, if you just want to assess the means or averages and the medians or center points of variables in a group of people, descriptives will do the trick. On the other hand, if you aim to understand differences between groups or relationships between variables and to infer or predict outcomes in the population, then you'll likely need both descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. So it's really important to get very clear about your research aims and research questions as well as your hypotheses before you start looking at which statistical methods to use. Never shoehorn a specific method into your research just because you like it or have experience with it. Your choice of methods must align with all the factors we've covered here. Now that we've looked at what quantitative analysis is, it's the two main branches of statistics and how to choose the right methods for your research, let's recap and bring it all together. We've covered a lot in this video. Well done on making it this far. Let's recap on the key points we've looked at. First, we ask the question, what is quantitative data analysis? As we discussed, quantitative analysis is all about analyzing number-based data, which can include both categorical and numerical data. These data are analyzed using statistical methods. The two main branches of statistics are descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptives describe your sample, 
the slice of the cake. While inferentials make predictions about what you'll find in the population, the full cake, based on what you've observed in the sample. As we saw, common descriptive statistical metrics include the mean, the median, the mode, standard deviation, and skewness. On the inferential side, we looked at t-tests, ANOVAs, correlation analysis, and regression analysis, all of which can help you make predictions about the population. Lastly, we asked the important question, how do I choose the right statistical methods? As we discussed, to choose the right statistical methods, you need to consider the type of data you're working, as well as your research questions and hypotheses. Remember, in this video, we've only looked at a handful of the most common quantitative methods. There are many, many more. So, be sure to check out the Grad Coach blog, as well as the other links below this video to get a fuller picture of what all is on offer in terms of statistical methods. Also, if you'd like us to cover any of the methods in more detail, be sure to leave a comment below. Okay, so that's end our uh, qualitative methods for this semester. So looking forward that you'll be able to uh, learn something from the subject, no? So on Friday, we have a quiz, okay? So thank you very much for attending and looking forward that the secretary could uh, submit no, the summary of the attendance for the entire semester. God bless everyone. Submit your final requirements next, next Friday.